This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. In the future, computers may be able to interface with your mind. Cars may drive themselves. Scientists may be able to grow new kidneys and other organs. My guest Michio Kaku has written a new book about scientific innovations in the works based on rapid advances in computers, biotechnology, and artificial intelligence. It's called Physics of the Future, How Science Will Shape Human Destiny and Our Daily Lives by the Year 2100. Kaku is a quantum physicist who describes his work as grappling with the equations that govern the subatomic particles out of which the universe is created. He co-founded string field theory. He's a professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York. One of his previous books, Physics of the Impossible, was the basis of his science channel TV show, Sci-Fi Science, Physics of the Impossible. Michio Kaku, welcome to Fresh Air. Let's look at some of the inventions you think might be ready for use within the next 30 years. Why don't we start with internet contact lenses? That's right. The rate at which we are miniaturizing the internet, it'll be inside our contact lens. So you blink and you go online. If you talk to somebody, you'll see their biography appear right next to their name. And if they speak Chinese to you, you'll see instantaneous translation of Chinese into English. Now, of course, the first people to buy these contact lenses will be college students studying for final examinations. They will simply blink and see all the exam questions right in their contact lens. The next people to buy these things would be people wait, wait, wait. looking won't for a they job. See, won't they see all the answers, too? <laughs> these <laughs> well, contact lenses are so great. Yes, I'm a professor, and it means that we have to uh, change the way we grill our students. No longer long strips of memorization, but concepts and principles have to be stressed. And people who are looking for a job will also buy these contact lens. In a cocktail party, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. You'll have a complete readout of who they are. And actors and actresses, uh, they'll never flub a line. They'll simply see all their lines right inside their contact lens. Now, these things already exist in some form. Um, I work for the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel sometimes, hosting their documentaries. And I took a film crew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, to look at the military's version of these Internet lenses. You place it on your helmet. It's a tiny lens. You flip it down, and immediately you see the Internet of the battlefield. Enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, armor, aircraft, all of it right inside your eyeball. How can you extrapolate everything that you did from what the military is using now? You know, that actors will use it to act and that we'll go to a cocktail party and see everybody's biography when we meet them. Well, I'm a physicist, and we have something called Moore's Law, which says the computer power doubles every 18 months. So every Christmas, we more or less assume that our toys and appliances are more or less twice as powerful as the previous Christmas. Uh, For example, your cell phone has more computer power than all of NASA when they put two men on the moon back in 1969. And a birthday card that sings happy birthday to you, that birthday card has a chip in it with more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Uh, Hitler, Stalin, Churchill would have killed to get that chip that you simply throw away in the garbage. Because of Moore's Law, we physicists can project 10, 15 years into the future with near mathematical precision. And prototypes have already been made of internet glasses, internet lenses, and also even a prototype of an internet contact lens. And so eventually, everyone will have it, and we will live in what is called augmented reality. And so this will be part of life. Uh, Everything we see around this will be annotated, footnoted, and we'll love it. You sure of that? I'm sure, because how many times have we bumped into somebody and we say, who is this person? Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, you will know exactly who you are talking to. And if you see an object you don't understand, you'll immediately understand what that object is. And this is going to have a revolutionary effect. One of the things you write about is how our minds, our brains, might in the future be able to um, interface with uh, artificial intelligence. I, I guess I have no idea how that would work. Well, on several levels, already at Brown University, uh, they've taken stroke victims and put a chip in their brain and connected the chip to a laptop computer. 
And these individuals who are paralyzed can now read email, write email, surf the web, uh, play video games, um, guide wheelchairs. Anything you can do on a computer, they can do as well, except they're trapped inside a paralyzed body. And we can also use this to control whoa, robotic whoa, whoa, whoa. arms. Let, let, let's back up. <laughs> so they're having a thought like move this chair or type this letter. How does that thought get um, translated I into the computer? What they do is they simply attach a chip into the brain, and then you are allowed to look on a computer screen where the cursor is located. Then it's like riding a bicycle. Painfully, you have to learn that certain thoughts control the movement of the cursor, moving it left, right, up, and down. It takes a while. It takes a few hours. But after a while, by looking at the cursor, you begin to realize that certain thoughts will move the cursor in certain directions. And after a while, you can simply move the cursor in any way to do, for example, crossword puzzles or to, to play video games. But it does take a while because the architecture of the brain is still not mapped out yet. That'll take many more decades before we have a roadmap, neuron for neuron, and can attach these things directly. What, what, However, you're, what we'll you're describing sounds like a really painstaking process. Like if you it want takes to... a few hours, but after that, somebody who is totally paralyzed uh, cannot communicate with their loved ones, cannot do anything except vegetate, all of a sudden can control objects around them, write emails, surf the web, um, anything you can do on the Internet, they can also do. And previously, they were trapped. And in animals, for example, we've, we've even taken it one step farther. Uh, monkeys have been connected at Duke University to robotic arms. So they control robotic arms, and they can e even grab bananas and eat bananas by controlling a mechanical arm that is connected to their brain. Now, in Japan, they've actually connected a robot called Asimo, one of the world's most advanced robots in the world, to a worker who ha puts on a helmet and the worker can, can actually control the upper body motions of Asimo. And this could also be the future of the space program. It's very dangerous to put astronauts in a moon base where there's radiation, solar flares, micrometeorites. It'd be much better to put robots on the moon and have them mentally connected to astronauts on the Earth. So let me ask you, if you take the kind of focused mind that you're talking about, and you take away all the technology <laughs> and think about what the mind can do. Does that make a powerful argument for meditation? Uh, well, the mind is powerful if it focuses and uh, reduces distractions. And uh, you can increase learning capabilities. But uh, you will have to enhance it uh, using uh, radio and using computers, especially if you get into very complicated things like memory. However, uh, two months ago, uh, history was made with a, a, a mouse brain. They actually were able to input a memory directly into a mouse. This is the first time in history it's been done. It's something right out of science fiction. What they did was they looked at the hippocampus of a mouse and tape recorded impulses as it learned a task. That's the gateway for memory. All memories first go through the hippocampus. They tape recorded the impulses. Then they gave it a chemical which made the, the mouse forget the task. Then they took this tape recording, this set of impulses, shot it back into the mouse, and the mouse immediately knew how to do the task. So this is the first time it's been demonstrated that you can actually tape record a memory and then reinsert the memory into a mouse and have the mouse perform the task that it previously forgot. Now, the implications of this are enormous because if all memories go through this hippocampus, this is also how our brain functions. And it means that memories in principle, it hasn't been done, of course, but memories in principle might be tape recorded and then shot right back into your brain or somebody else's brain so that somebody, for example, could learn calculus without having to study too hard. Well, how do you record a memory? What is... How do you what measure a, a memory? Yeah. Uh, what they've done is, since we do not really understand the architecture of the brain, uh, reverse engineering is still science fiction, what they've done is they've simply taken the impulses, uh, the impulses that go through this part of the brain, which is the gateway, the gateway to memories. So all new memories have to go through this gateway, and you can simply tape record impulses as it goes through the gateway, 
and then later reinsert the tape recorded message. And in the coming decades, as we get better and better at it, we may actually be able to record whole sequences of memories, like vacations, for example. Now, when you were in high school, um, and you're kind of famous for this, you built a particle accelerator in your mother's garage. What is a particle accelerator? Well, it's an atom smasher. Uh, The biggest one in the world is much bigger than the one I built in high school. It's 17 miles in circumference, and it creates a mini Big Bang to recreate the conditions of the early universe. What I did when I was 16 years old is I went to Westinghouse. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I assembled a 6-kilowatt, 2.3 million electron volt electron accelerator in the garage. When it was finished, I would plug it in, There was this huge crackling sound as I consumed six kilowatts of power. I blew out every circuit breaker in the house. All the lights were plunged in darkness. And my poor mom would come home every night, see the lights flicker and die, and say to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Uh, What's wrong with him? Why does he build these machines in the garage? Well, I love to build machines. It got me into Harvard, so I can't complain. And that began my career as a physicist. So you ended up, as a student, being mentored by Edward Teller, Teller being known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. He worked on the Manhattan Project, which developed the atom bomb. When you started um, studying with him, did you think about going into nuclear weapons development as a career? Well, he very strongly urged me to go into nuclear weapons design. Uh, I was in high school. Uh, I was uh, playing with antimatter. Uh, Antimatter naturally occurs from a substance called sodium-22. I put antimatter in a magnetic field and photographed the tracks of antimatter. I went to the National Science Fair, and I met Edward Teller. In fact, I was on television with Edward Teller. I didn't have to explain to Edward Teller what antimatter was. He immediately knew what it was. He immediately knew what I was doing and he offered me a scholarship to Harvard. However, you know, he had an ulterior motive as well. Let's be very frank about this. There's a book written by a New York Times reporter called Star Warriors, and it's about a scholarship that Edward Teller was promoting. I was a recipient of that scholarship, and later it came out that the purpose of the scholarship, in part, was to create a cadre core of young, bright scientists to propel a Star Wars program. Uh, These are young physicists, just like me, who fell under his wing and were shepherded into the weapons program. And when I got my bachelor's degree from Harvard, he made a pitch. He made a very big pitch. I could go to Los Alamos, I could go to Livermore, I could go to MIT and study nuclear weapons design. Unfortunately for him, I decided that I wanted to work uh, in things that were not so destructive, but perhaps had even more power, and that is an explosion called the Big Bang, which was infinitely more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. You're Japanese, and your father was born in Japan. Did the fact that um, atom bombs were used on the country of your father's birth affect your decision at all? I mean, understanding well, parents... like the destructive power of it and maybe knowing something about all the civilians who were killed? Well, my parents were actually born in California, However, they were sent back to Japan, which was very common for immigrant families, and they grew up in Japan. They were U.S. citizens, born in California but raised in Japan. And then they came back to California at the wrong time. They came back to California before Pearl Harbor. And when Pearl Harbor hit, there was all this hysteria. And my parents were then locked up and shipped out to a relocation camp along with 110,000 other Japanese Americans. And my parents were citizens, and yet they too were rounded up and uh, sent off to the camp. Uh, They lived from 1942 to 1946 behind barbed wire and machine guns. Uh, All civil liberties were stripped from them, and they spent the war years basically uh, locked up behind barbed wire. Now, the fact that the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima had an impact in me being Japanese Americans, but I said to myself that maybe there's some good out of that can come out of this. Maybe science can, can liberate us from poverty, disease, oppression, ignorance. And I firmly believe this. I believe that science is the engine of prosperity. 
that if you look around at the wealth of civilization today, it's the wealth that comes from science. And by being a scientist, I can be part of this grand search for knowledge which will liberate because this knowledge will create prosperity and much of the problems of human society comes out of scarcity. And I think that by creating a world of plenty, by creating institutions and uh, organizations that promote knowledge and promote understanding, I think uh, I could be part of being in a better world. Now, among your accomplishments is that you are a co-founder of String Field Theory. I'm going to ask you to explain what that is in the absolute simplest way possible. <laughs> uh, simplest and briefest way possible. Okay, well, Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life chasing after a theory of everything, an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. One theory which would summarize all physical law into a single expression. Well, today we think we have the theory. It's called string theory, very controversial, but we're testing the periphery of it with huge machines like the one in Geneva, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider. Now, what I've done is I've taken all the equations of string theory, which fill up an entire volume, a gigantic book of equations, and I've summarized it into one equation, one inch long. That's my equation. It's called string field theory. The language of physics is something called field theory. We have magnetic fields, gravitational fields, electric fields. That's the language of physics. But string theory was this hodgepodge of little equations and rules of thumb. And what I decided to do was create a field theory of strings, just like we have a field theory of magnetism, a field theory of electricity, a field theory of gravity. And that's what I did. We can summarize electricity, magnetism, and gravity into equations one inch long. And that's the power of field theory. And so I said to myself, I will create a field theory of strings. And when I did it one day, it was incredible, realizing that on a sheet of paper, I can write down an equation which summarized almost all physical knowledge. That was power, the power of mathematics. If I asked you what the theory is, would I understand your answer? <laughs> well, very simply, that all the subatomic particles, neutrons, protons, quarks, are nothing but uh, musical notes on a tiny rubber band. That when you twang the rubber band, it changes from one frequency to another. So it changes from an electron to a neutrino. And you twang it enough, it can turn into all the subatomic particles we see in the world. So all the subatomic particles that make up our body are nothing but different notes on many, many, many tiny little violin strings, little rubber bands. And that physics is nothing but the laws of harmony of these vibrating strings. Chemistry is nothing but the melodies you can play on these vibrating strings. The universe is a symphony of strings. And the mind of God that Einstein wrote eloquently about for the last 30 years of his life is cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. That is the mind of God. How do you know you're right? How do you know the equation is correct? Well, no matter how beautiful the theory, uh, one irritating fact can dismiss uh, the, entire, um, the entire formalism. So it has to be proven. So that's where we hope the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest machine of science ever built, will create what are called sparticles. Sparticles are superparticles. They are partners of ordinary particles. We're made out of the lowest octave of the string. But these little rubber bands have higher octaves. That is, new particles that haven't been seen yet. They're called sparticles, or superparticles for short. And we hope to create them with the Large Hadron Collider. It's still a bet. We physicists are taking bets as to whether or not the Large Hadron Collider is powerful enough to create sparticles. But if it does, that could change the whole landscape of modern physics. Sounds exciting. <laughs> I it's yeah, it's exciting. I want to thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, my pleasure. Michio Kaku is a professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York. He co-founded Stringfield Theory. His new book is called Physics of the Future. This is Fresh Air.